is calling Oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus so much Emma and Leslie thank you for preparing our hearts for the word of God this morning we have been in a study in the book of Acts and today we're going to a different time now in Paul's ministry his missionary journeys are complete he's moved uh, to Jerusalem to speak to the Jews there on the feast of the Pentecost and he had been warned in chapter 20 don't go not good things are going to happen by the prophet Agabus. He still had a zeal to go. And so today we're looking at trouble in Jerusalem. April the 5th, 1943, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was arrested. He was imprisoned by the Gestapo for his resistance to the Nazi regime there in Germany. For several years... Uh, Bonhoeffer would speak out boldly against the Nazis, and eventually it caught up with him. He saw his country sliding, and he felt that he couldn't remain silent. He had to take a stand. Two years later, only just a few weeks from the end of World War II, he found himself in Buchenwald concentration camp facing the death sentence. And on Sunday, April the 8th, he led a service for other prisoners. Shortly at the end of that service, two civilians walked in, and they quickly looked at prisoner, prisoner Bonhoeffer and said, come with us. Well, of course, all the other prisoners know what that meant because that had happened very often in their prison. Bonhoeffer said his goodbyes, and quickly he was taken away. An English prisoner who had survived the war describes that very moment. 
He said, Bonhoeffer took me aside and said, this is the end. But for me, it's the beginning of life. The next day, Bonhoeffer was hanged there in the prison. And one of the Nazi SS doctors who had witnessed the death called him a brave and composed and devoted man of God to the very end. This is what he said when he witnessed his life being taken. Through a half-open door, I saw Pastor Bonhoeffer still in prison clothes. And what was he doing? He was kneeling in prayer to the Lord his God. The devotion and evident conviction of being heard that I saw in that prayer of this intensely captivating man moved me to depths. This is the end, Bonhoeffer was saying, but for me, it's the beginning of life. My question this morning, what makes a man facing a certain death talk like that? What makes him have that type of spirit, that attitude, that fortitude to say, for to me, it's just the beginning where do you find faith like that? Where did his faith start? How did he become such a strong warrior for God? Surely such a man had discovered a living hope. A hope that is beyond the grave. A hope that all of us have when we trust Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. How do we explain it? Well, we know there is suffering in this world. In fact, in Peter, we find in Timothy that uh, they that live godly will suffer persecution. Not only is there suffering in the world, folks, but there is suffering in the Christian life. And it's abundantly obvious found in a number of examples that we find in Scripture. Of course, the Apostle Paul, as we see him being arrested in chapter 21. Of course, we saw it in the life of Peter, and we saw it in John when he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. But even Jesus himself, who demonstrated that suffering will come and will happen. Back in chapter 19, we saw these words in verse 21 that he said, After these things were ended, Paul purposed in his spirit that when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, that he would go back to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. It was Paul's desire to go back to Jerusalem. He wanted to make it there in time for uh, the Passover, Easter. But he was behind because, you know, ships didn't just sail easily. They had to wait for the winds. So his next goal was to get there for Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ. You see, the Apostle Paul was a Jew. And being a Jew, his resolve was the Jewish people. And he wanted to get back. And you know, that's perfectly normal, since Paul, being a Jew, loved his nation. There's just this love that you see for the Jews. Even today, I remember visiting Jerusalem and, and to see, even in the young people's life, the love for their country. Uh, it, it's amazing. I just wish I'd see it here in America. We have so much, but the Jews just love their heritage. And that was the Apostle Paul. And he wanted to get back. He loved the promises of God. He loved his nation. He loved all the rituals and the ceremonies which had been given to the Jewish people that pointed them to Jesus Christ. His heart was broken as he saw their bitterness. His heart was broken as he saw their frustration and their hostility and opposition to the cause of Christ, which came from his own people, the Jews, the Israelites. And he knew that at Pentecost there would be a large, large gathering. One more opportunity. One more opportunity to glorify his God. One more opportunity to honor his Savior, Jesus Christ. And oh, he looked forward to that. He was so hungry to see the Jews, to come to know Jesus Christ. Well, if you look in Acts chapter 21 this morning, as we look at this passage this morning, we're going to go through a number of the passage, but if they're in verse number 17, it says, And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. I, I want us to see here, after those things, 
He comes from Tyre and moves into Jerusalem. And the people knew he was coming. And the brethren in Jerusalem received him well. Now, at this time, this is about 62 A.D., the church in Jerusalem was mainly made up of Jewish people who were believers. It had grown to a population of something like 20 to 30,000 Jewish Christians. And he was excited to be able to go tell them what was going on and to give them the update. And I want us to see just kind of five quick things of this chapter. And the very first thing is their reception. They received him warmly. They received him gladly. And it says, And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us, and that day following, Paul went in unto James. Who was James? James was the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had with him a, a group of believers, Gentiles, that were coming with him, and he was introducing these believers to the elders of the church of Jerusalem. And Paul said to, to these uh, leaders, he says, this is Titus, and oh, over here is Timothy, and, and over there is Aristarchus, and to my left is Socumbus, and Sobiator, and Tychius, and Gaius of Derby. There were seven. I wonder what those Gentiles must have felt like to run in to James, who was a half-brother of Jesus Christ. That must have been a marvel to them to be able to see that and to be able to witness that wonderful, wonderful reception as they were able to see him there and to be able to understand a little bit more. Verse 19 and 20, we see at that reception, and when they had heard the things that Paul and those seven Gentiles told what was going on in Europe and Asia Minor, they said, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. You see, uh, this reception was received well, and they glorified what they were sharing. But there was also a concern. The church's concern there in Jerusalem was false information that they had been receiving about the Apostle Paul, that he had been teaching false teachings. And that's the second thing I want you to notice in chapter 21, their concern. And it says in verse 21, And they are informed about all that what took place, that thou teachest the Jews which are among the Gentiles to do this, to forget Moses, to forget the rituals, to forget the, the law. We, he was being told that he was teaching it, and that you should not circumcise. Again, this was their custom, folks. When you grow up in, a, in a Judaism, there were many customs that they had, and of course, it was so important to them. And you know, it's not wrong to, to continue to to see those things. The New Testament had not been fully written. They were reading some of the law. They were reading some of the truths and teachings. And yet they heard that Paul was telling Gentiles and other Jews along the Asia and European area, don't do it, don't do it, which was not true. It was false accusations that this was going on. What is it therefore that the multitude must needs to come together for they will hear that thou art come? It's going to be a problem. They had a concern, and, you know, how are we going to handle this situation? How are we going to handle these issues that are, that are taking place here? And so uh, Paul was going to come greatly to them and say, hey, listen, I want to tell you what God is doing. They said, but they're not going to receive you, Paul. And so they had this concern. But the thing I want you to notice about the Apostle Paul is that he says it's these things that God has done, not me. You know, sometimes you'll get a preacher and say, hey, look how great I am. Look how all the great accomplishments that I have done. Not Paul. Paul never did that. Many of you remember Cory Tin Boom, and, you know, when she was finally released from the Nazi prisons and she came back to America and she had so many responsibilities and people were calling on her, asking questions of how things were there in the prisons. And somebody asked her, does it ever get to you, Cory? Uh, you know, you are getting all this limelight put on you. And, and, and how do you handle that? Listen to what she said. She said uh, these comments. She said, you know, it might be difficult to remain humble because of the ministries that God has given me. But you remember when Jesus came to Jerusalem that last time, that last week 
which we know today as the triumphal entry. Do you remember the donkey that he was sitting upon? And you remember everybody was taking these, these palm tree branches and throwing them out there. They were taking their garments off and they were singing the praise, praise to the Lord. She said, you know, that donkey carrying Jesus on that Palm Sunday, witness of all that, the praising and the singing. And she said this statement, do you think for a moment that as that donkey entered into Jerusalem, that the head of that donkey, any of that was for him? No, it was for the Savior sitting on the back. Folks, what we do for the cause of Christ is for his glory. And we don't take any glory, and Paul didn't do either. And now he's a little frustrated because of the concern that he's hearing from these Jewish leaders. I'm sure those seven Gentiles who were coming, they, they had collected an offering to give to the Jews. You remember, it had been prophesied that things were going to be bad in Jerusalem. They had a famine. And so as he was visiting all these churches in Asia and in Europe, they had some good money that they had brought back to help the Jewish believers. And he says, you know, he thought they were going to be grateful but it comes to find out they were concerned that he was teaching false teachings and instead of rejoicing all that God had been doing, it must have been hard for Paul to hear that people were slandering him. I don't like slander. Slander is not a good thing, but sometimes it happens. How do we handle it? Sometimes the best way to handle it is to remain silent. Sometimes you have to speak up. But Paul justly just sat there and listened to what these Jewish leaders were saying. So, you know what, we do have a concern, and, and we feel that this thing could get out of hand, and there could be a riot, and there could be an uproar. We got an idea. If we could do this, I, I, I think you might be able to see that the Jewish people see you don't believe those things. And so there was a request there in verse 23, do therefore this that we say to thee. We have these four men which have a vow on them. It was the Nazarite vow. It was a vow that uh, uh, they would take for devotion, dedication. You know, we remember back in Samson, his vow was for a lifetime. Well, not always was it for a lifetime. It would be a 30-day ritual. And, and one of the things they would do, they would shave their head and then they would bring sacrifices. Uh, they would uh, come to the temple and, and, and worship God and says, you know what? If you do that, Paul, you come with these four men they're going to observe you, they're going to watch you, and, and they're going to see these teachings that you're saying are not true. Look what it says in the next verse. And them take and purify themselves with them and be at charges with them. In other words, pay their expenses. It was costly. It, it wasn't a cheap thing because of all the different sacrifices that they would have to offer, that they may also shave their heads and that they all may know that those things whereof that they were informed concerning thee are nothing but you thou thyself also walk us orderly and keep us the law so they share this uh the, this thought with him and said you know uh, if you could just do this and then in verse uh this this nazarite vow, vow that uh, you would take they, they would have these expenses they would have these things you could pay their expense doing this you would be sowing reverence for the law. Doing this, you would stop the rumors. Yet there in verse 25, oh, we, we see that uh, that, uh, that was not taking case. And it says there in verse 25, as touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strang strangled and from fornication. So if you do this, Paul, I think that's going to be helpful. Notice uh, the third thing, the, uh, actually the uh, response. That should be response. Uh, in verses 26 and 27, it says here the response. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered in the temple. What did he do? He agreed. I'll do it. To signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until the day that the offering should be offered for every one of them. And then in verse 27, and when the seven days were complete and they ended, the Jews which were of Asia 
mostly from Ephesus. You remember there were some problems in Ephesus. He had been there three years and there were these Jews that were false teachers and they had come to the Pentecost and they were there and they said, we got to get him. We got to find how we can shake him up. And when they saw him in the temple, they stirred up all the people and they grabbed him and they laid their hands on him and they were able to cry out and get people to, to listen and to help them. And so his response was to, to, to agree with them and to assist them. Well, the outcome is such as this in verses 28 to 40, crying out, men of Israel, help. You can see this scene. Here is Paul. He is with these four men that are taking this vow. And he had with, a, with him a, a few other of Gentiles. And these Gentiles knew that they could not walk past the court of the Gentiles. If they go past that, they were going to be in big trouble. And so they started crying out against the people and the law in this place. And they said, he has brought Greeks into our temple. And he hath polluted this holy place. Folks, this was the start of the downfall for the Apostle Paul's ministry. Folks, this was the time that uh, he had been warned. You go to Jerusalem, there are some bad things that are going to happen. But as I told you earlier, Paul, being a Jew, felt he needed to go, even knowing that he would be going through some tremendous suffering, troubles there in Jerusalem. Well, there are three accusations that were made against him by these men. Number one, being anti-Semitic. He, he didn't get along with the, the uh, others there. He was against the Jews by their teaching. He said he taught against their law. And he spoke out against the temple of God. All of these things were, were looked at and weighed and they were crying out. Can you imagine the scene? What was going on there that day? You know, speaking out against him and uh, he had to stand strong. Well, if you recall, you know, remember that no Gentile was ever allowed to go into the, the area of the temple. And uh, they had that middle wall partitioned to protect it. And there was a sign up there in the temple. In fact, I was reading somewhere that archaeologists a number of years ago dug up and found portion of that sign that was there, there in the temple of that day warning them. And that sign read this, no alien is to enter within the railing and enclosure around the temple. Whosoever is caught will be responsible to himself for his death, which will properly ensue. That uproar against Paul must have taken place within the temple itself. Now, folks, Paul knew better. He knew that that would be the last thing he would ever do. But they had to find an excuse, just like they had to find an excuse to take our Savior, Jesus Christ. They had to find some way to capture him. And to be able to, to say, we got to have him killed. He is an uh, uh, enemy to us. And so those Jews were doing so. And so it says in verse 30, And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul, and they drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. Folks, as we see that thought there, the outcome... We, we, we understand that it was going to be difficult. It was going to be a challenge. The chief captain, this was uh, a fortress that was 75 feet above the temple, and uh, the chief of the army there, the Roman soldiers, would be there watching to make sure things were calm. And he saw this stirring going on. He could hear it. And the people were grabbing Paul. They were beating him. They were, uh, you know, fixing to kill Paul because they said, you have brought a Greek into the temple, our sacred place. Fortunately, he ran to the rescue, and it says he accompanied him, and he bound Paul with two chains. Again, a prophecy. Back in chapter 19 and chapter 20, not to go to Jerusalem. They said, uh, the captain there, chief of the, uh, of the army, said, demanded who he was and what he had done. Folks, Paul defends himself. The chief captain came near and he took him and he commanded him to be bound. 
and demanded who he was and following the multitude of the people followed after crying away with him when did we hear that before it was some 30 years earlier when jesus christ was in jerusalem same terminology away with him here the apostle paul who is possibly the greatest christian that walked the face of the earth they turned on him and i want you to notice this the church was strong there were jewish leaders that believed in jesus christ as i mentioned 20 to 30,000 but where's James? Where's the other church leaders standing up for him? Because they knew that these accusations were false. There's no mention of them standing up for them. You know, that's kind of like sometimes the church today. We, we wound our own enemy. We, we wound our own people, Christians. Instead of praying for them, instead of encouraging them, instead of standing up for them, we, we find something and we tackle them and we, we make these false accusations against them. And then in verse 37, it says, And as Paul was led to the castle, he spoke to the chief captain, May I speak to thee? And all of a sudden, this captain says, Wait a minute, you're speaking Greek as an educated man. I thought you were an Egyptian. I thought you were that man that has escaped, that was going to overcome and take the walls of Jerusalem down. That's my thought. I thought we finally caught you, but you're not that person. There's something different about you. Tell me more. And so the apostle Paul said unto uh, him, I'm a man which am of a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Sicily, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak to the people. Suffer me to speak to the people. He says, I got a challenge. I got to speak up. I got to speak for what I'm here for. God has changed my life. Many years ago, I used to be one of the Jews that are making this slander against me. And I would go to those places and see people stoned to death. But I'm not that person. Let me please speak to the people. Well, in chapter, uh, in verse 40, we see that the captain was going to give him that privilege, that chief. And for some reason, our chapter ending ends right there. They kind of cut it off when he gets ready to speak to the people. And you're going to have to wait till next week to see what he said, to see how he spoke up uh, to the people. A man of authority, a man of grace. And when he had given him the license to speak, Paul stood on the stairs and he beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, folks, I believe that was God. Remember, it was a mob scene. You know what a mob scene is like. And all of a sudden, the chief of the guards, and there were a thousand of them, let him stand up there, 75 feet above there in the fortress. And then when he started to speak, everybody became quiet. God was going to give Paul an opportunity and remember he's been beaten he's bloody but he wanted to share the gospel with all of his heart with all of his might with the people how do we look at this thought how do we uh see the situation here what would you have done if you were the apostle paul would you just kind of say all right they don't want to hear me forget it i won't tell them that god loves them no not the apostle paul Apostle Paul wanted to tell his story, and he was given that right, and he was given that privilege. And as I said in chapter 22, he shares the gospel with all of those people. Well, time does not permit for me to do so, but I do want to close with an application. An application that we find in Acts chapter 21, and the very first thing I want you to notice that Christian living may involve suffering. Christian living may involve suffering there in second timothy chapter three it tells us all that live godly will suffer persecution folks if you're living for god the world and the enemy doesn't like us to stand for truth and there's going to be conflict there's going to be confrontation just like we saw the apostle paul there's going to be those that are going to speak against us the longer we live we will see that even more relevant in our day what did james say when we go through these trials when we go through these sufferings 
Remember his words? Count it all joy. Count it joy. Folks, I know some of us here in this auditorium uh, have gone through some challenging times. And you thought, there's no more that I can handle. This is one of the hardest things I could ever go through. But we're reminded in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 that God is able to help us. There's no trial, no suffering that He gives us that we're not able to handle. He gives us the grace to go through it. He gave Paul that grace, and folks, He gives you that grace. We will understand that. There in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul reluctantly recounts his resume of suffering, which included many different things. And, and let me just quickly remind you of some of the things that he went through. He was whipped 39, with 39 lashes, and that happened five different occasions. He was beaten with rods three different occasions, pumpled with stones one time, left to be dead. He was shipwrecked three times. He was adrift at sea one night, one day. There was danger from the rivers. There was danger from the uh, robbers. There was dangers from his own people. And there were dangers from the Gentiles. There was dangers in the cities that he would visit. There was dangers in the wilderness, dangers at the sea, dangers from false brothers that taught falsely. There was toil and hardship. There was sleepless nights, many. He was hungry and thirsty on many occasions. He was cold and exposed. The pressure of anxiety from some of the churches came upon him daily. Folks, he was trying to walk the walk of a Christian. And sometimes walking the walk of a Christian does bring trials, does bring sufferings. And Christian living may involve that. There's a second thing I want you to see. Christian living may involve slander. In verses 15 to 25, we read the slander and the accusations were made against him. We told you those three false teachings that were spoken up about the Apostle Paul. You know, slander is, is hurtful. You know, there's an old saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Folks, that's not true. People speak badly of us. Folks, it, it, it hits home. It was Jesus in his Beatitudes, when he spoke uh, the Beatitudes there in Matthew chapter 5, in his great sermon on the mount, he, he reminded us that uh, people will revile you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. Folks, that happens. It happens often. It happens to, to good people, people that take a stand, that strongly hold on to the things of the Lord. We, we, we need to be prepared. We need to, to handle it. How do you deal with slander? How do we go through it? Well, let me remind you that slander is a serious sin, and if you're guilty of it, and as I told you earlier, Sometimes we are guilty of hurting our own. The only army that goes after their own, Christians. How can we do that? We've got to be careful. We've got to be cautious not to slander brothers and sisters in Christ. And that was what was happening to the Apostle Paul. You know, slander like its cousin gossip is incredibly destructive. It will tear down a person's ministry. It lies in wait for blood, Proverbs chapter 12 verse 6. It destroys neighbors, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 9, slander. And it separates close friends, Proverbs 16, 28. It will break friendship. It will break fellowship if we're not careful. But you see, when both gossip and slander are involved in destructive speech, slander will add that additional element of dishonesty. It will bring in that last part there, what is it about gossip? It spreads the fire, but it's the slander that sparks it. It gets it going. It gets it started. It's sometimes right to defend your reputation before those who have slandered you, especially slander, uh, slander that damages our ministry. But really, it's my observation, church, I think it's often better to stay silent. Remain silent. You know, that alone will answer. You know, if they want you to, to see something from you, they want to get something out of you, remain quiet. And that's a hard thing to do. Because remember another thing James says, the tongue's the hardest thing to, to hold in place. 
And sometimes when slander is said against us, we want to get our dukes up, we want to defend ourselves, and we want to go right after whoever is making these accusations. But sometimes one of the best things to do is remain silent. And what do we see Paul do? He doesn't speak out. In fact, after he's been beaten and he's bloodied, he says to the chief of the, of the army, he says, please let me speak to the people. You remember the words Jesus said when he was on the cross? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that was the same heart of Paul. That was the same heart that he had. Somehow, some way, he, he, he was desiring that he could be able to encourage them. And then lastly, Christian living may involve sacrifice. There in the last verses that we've looked at, he's not going to be killed now because somebody came in and intervened. It was the Roman army. God was in control, folks. God has our best at heart. And he knew that Paul shouldn't have come to Jerusalem, but God overtook and knew that this was going to roll into the plan to have him arrested so that he would eventually go to Rome where he had preached the gospel and see the Roman Christians but he doesn't get killed there in Jerusalem. Yes, there was trouble. That was 62 AD. 14 years later, after being in prison and writing a number of the uh, letters, the epistles, Paul is martyred. Paul's life is taken. And what does he say in verses 21 and verse 13? He says, if I'm ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem, for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember his verse in Philippians chapter 1? What did he say? For me to live is Christ. He didn't stop there. But to die is gain. If God sees my need to be taken, to God be the glory. For me to live as Christ, and every ounce that God gives me, every breath that he allows me to breathe, I'm excited and I want to use it to his honor and his glory. But when he's ready to take me, to God be the glory. What a testimony. He's the one that wrote Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye surrender, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Folks, we're alive, and yes, every day we ought to be sacrificing and dying to self, not letting the flesh to live, but letting Christ to live. Christian living involves sacrifice. That's the story. That's what it's all about. 2002, July. At the ministry we love so much that we send our kids every year to the wilds. There was a counselor that was working that summer. It was her second summer. She had just graduated as an elementary gradu uh, graduate, and she was going to be looking forward to teaching in Christian school. And she was there working as a counselor. She was 23 years old. Her name was Angela Burdick. She was using an inner tube to slide off a hill into the lake. But Angela didn't know how to swim. Angela was holding tightly onto the inner tube, and you know, when she went off that slide and into the lake, there were lifeguards there, but they didn't notice because there was a lot of other boys and girls that somehow when she came down, she lost her grip on the tube, and she slipped down, and she drowned. They didn't know about it. She was a counselor. That night at supper, when they were doing head count, they were looking, we're missing Angela, where's Angela? And they started tracing back all the steps of, where is she, what happened? And finally they said, the last place we saw her, she was at the lake, and she was having a great time with her kids, and she was on an inner tube. But we didn't see her since. They called in the authorities, and the authorities had to drain portion of the lake, and they found Angela's body. Angela, a young adult, 23 years old. You know, that particular morning, they found her diary. She kept a devotional diary. And that particular day, in the diary, she wrote something like this. I love serving my Savior. It's the greatest desire of my heart, and I look forward to serving Him. 
But God, if you're ready to take me home today, I'm ready. She didn't know that when she wrote that diary, that occasion, that day, that would be her last writing of her devotion. God took her. Angela went on to be with her Savior. Folks, she was doing what she loved. She loved working with young people, and that was an emotional thing for the whole camp. My daughter was a counselor that year, and I remember her calling me, telling Dad, it's been terrible what's happened today on our campus. But that funeral, there were people that came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Folks, yes, we're told that there are some times that we will suffer for Christ. It might not mean that we will give our life, but there will be some trials. Are we going to stand like the Apostle Paul? Are we going to stand strong through the difficult times that sometimes we have to go through?